Hey, wait, I wasn't ready. Can you guys all come back in five minutes? I gotta fix the camera and make some porridge because puppets eat porridge. Today's presentation is being videotaped, so watch out what you say. And we're gonna cover some important things that will make your head spin. You get it? Make your head spin. So anyway, being very devoid of humor or anything very interesting to say, I will turn this over to our presenter, who is even worse than I am. Uh, good luck with the presentation. I hope you can stay awake to answer the polling questions. Okay, thank you very much. Wow, thanks for nothing. I am Alan Gassman. No, he isn't. He's someone else. No, I am. I'm Alan Gassman, and I am here to talk about practical planning with the Corporate Transparency Act. Now, at first, I thought that they asked me to do this presentation because I am so transparent. But, oh, and I'm not sharing my screen. Okay, well, that's all right. I can share my screen when I'm ready to share my screen, right? Thank you very much. The puppet talks. Anyway, I am here to talk about the Corporate Transparency Act. The Corporate Transparency Act was enacted in 2020 by 92 senators and a vast majority of congressmen over the veto of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump's veto did not deter the passage of this act. A lot of people, including me, were thinking or hoping that the act would not take effect on January 1st, 2024, but we have seen nothing to indicate that. We are surprised, we shouldn't be surprised, but we have been surprised that the Treasury Department has not yet opened the portal or shown us exactly how the disclosures are gonna work. They have issued some very helpful uh, regulations and we know a lot about what needs to happen, but I can't tell you that we know everything that needs to happen. But what's going to be very, very important here is that you need to be ready and your clients need to be ready to report ownership and control of state filed entities. And what that means is not only do you need to report the ownership and control of all state filed entities by the end of 2024, but you need to report them accurately. And I have clients and you have clients that really don't know who the owners of their entities are. I just got a new estate planning package in from a very sophisticated client with dozens of entities and the first thing he said is i just want to let you know that the tax returns are not consistent with the operating agreements for my entities which are also not consistent with the financial statements for my entities and that is very very common so which ownership am i going to report for him when the transparency act takes effect this is an opportunity for you to clean up your present situation and to reach out to your best clients and your biggest clients and your most sophisticated clients to get them cleaned up before having to file under the Transparency Act. And who are they filing with? Well, dear client, I have to I have to disclose the ownership of these entities, who's in control of them, where you live, and a copy of your driver's license to the criminal authorities who work in the Treasury Department. And we need to do this by December 31st. How's everyone gonna feel about that? Not everyone is gonna be so happy about it. I was discussing this a couple of weeks ago 
with some clients who are in LLC arrangements with people who have criminal records. And they said, man, we don't want to be in this relationship anymore because we don't want the federal aid agency under the Treasury Department to come look at us because we're involved with her. So all of these considerations come to mind. We'll cover this and more after a little bit of a uh, introduction here. If you have come through CPA Academy, you are welcome and you will get a hour of CPA Academy credit. If you just answer, I think, three of the four polling questions, we've made the polling questions extra easy today uh, just because we decided to. If you came through our uh, web port, then if you're a Florida lawyer, you can get CLE credit. Just email us and we will make sure you get what you need. Otherwise, I just hope you enjoy the presentation or uh, if you like to suffer, I can help you with that as well. In about three to four hours, this presentation will be posted onto our YouTube channel, which has all of our presentations of recent, and also it will be sent to you by Monday so that you can forward it to anyone you dislike or who has insomnia. The topic is also covered in the Thursday report that we published February 27, 2023. You can just uh, Google Gassman Thursday report, uh, Transparency Act, and it will come up and you can read the article. Marty Shinkman and I will be talking about uh, the Transparency Act on a Weinberg 90 minute, not so free presentation coming up soon. Uh, at 1230 today, by the way, we're going to do a free presentation uh, going through where we are with the Estate View software. And I just wanted to show one thing off for you here. I'm really proud of it because I think it's neat. This is the Estate View software. It's free until December 31st. You go to estateview.link and then your password, your secret password, don't tell anyone is the word test, T-E-S-T, -E and your top secret name is test, T-E-S-T, -E at test.com. If you need that, let us know. And if, you, if I went too fast, but here, when you click on news, N-E-W-S, it will show you news feed that you select, and it will show you between four and seven news feeds at the same time. I click option, I click seven, then I'm seeing, oops, it stopped. Let me go back. So I click seven there, and now I'm seeing seven news feeds, and I can pick my news feeds. Right now we have just a few of them, we're gonna be adding them, but then every 30 minutes it will automatically update. So now when I wanna see the news, I'm just gonna have one thing, one place to click, and I can see the news from several sources. So that's a, a new little uh, fun thing for the state view. All right, the first polling question. Hold on to your hats, think carefully. If you give us the wrong answer, nothing bad happens. Which of the following things is true? Number one, our CPA firm will provide Transparency Act registration assistance. Number two, our law firm will provide CTA registration assistance. Number three, our CPA firm will not provide CTA registration assistance. Number four, our law firm will not provide CTA registration assistance. By the way, if you're a non-CPA accounting firm, then you can certainly answer uh, as if you were a CPA firm. And number five, I am glad not to be a CPA or law firm. So, Wesley, how are we doing with answers here? Hey, we're at 80%. When we get to 89%, we will go to the next slide. I know many of you answer late just to hold up the process so that we have less time to learn. 
How are we doing, Wesley? 87. 87, good enough. Let's go to the next slide, page 17. Everyone knows Marty Shankman. Everyone loves Marty Shankman. Marty did the first slide deck on this uh, presentation. It was fantastic. I changed it so you can blame any issues with these slide decks on me, not Marty, but anything good in the slide decks definitely came from Marty. Later on, if there's time or at the end, I'm gonna come back to page 18 and I'm gonna show you the musical hit, Corporate Advisor Man, sung to the tune of Secret Agent Man, provided by me, not by Marty. So that gives you something to look forward to, to your, in your day. It will definitely cheer up your day. And Wesley, we know how to play that, so it actually plays. Brittany shows you how. We think so. All right, well, we'll know in 50 minutes whether we're gonna get it right or not. Okay, the Corporate Transparency Act is serious, serious business. Here's one reason. If you fail to file timely or you file wrong, the penalty is only $500 per day with no limit. So what's 365 times 500? Big money. Not to mention up to two years in prison. So we have to take these rules very, very seriously. Now, if you make an innocent error and you have reasonable cause, the client gave you the wrong information or there was a snafu, you're not gonna have to worry so much. But if you have an error that you make and the government thinks that you made that error in order to avoid doing the right thing, if your client has done some wrong things, then the penalties can be significant. Let me mention, so I don't forget, that there are emails and certain organizations indicating that filing needs to be done by licensed lawyers and that the determination of ownership and the determination of control of an entity is the practice of law, not something that an accountant or another professional can do. I personally, impulsively, disagree with that position. I was at one point the uh, chairman of the tax section, uh, the chairman of the subcommittee on the unauthorized practice of law for the Florida Bar tax section at one point. And our position, and this was in the 1980s, was that you didn't have to be a lawyer to create a pension plan. And there were some people that were angry with me, but I said, let's face it, the pension plan actuaries are better at this than the lawyers are. Is there a public problem? Well, CPAs create K-1s, CPAs create financial statements. If I'm trusting a CPA to create a K-1 to tell me the ownership of an entity and I'm trusting a CPA to, to prepare or a financial statement, which has all kinds of complexities, that most lawyers could never even begin to understand. If a CPA can prepare an audit report, don't tell me that a CPA cannot prepare a corporate uh, report under the CTA. But the question is, number one, will the CPA have malpractice insurance if there's something wrong? We would hope so, but I would think that the malpractice insurance carriers are having to decide what they're gonna do here. Number two, is a CPA qualified to read a trust agreement 
to determine whether the grantor of an irrevocable trust is considered to be a beneficial owner under the act because the grantor has the power to replace trust assets with assets of equal value or the power to replace the trustee? You know, maybe not. Maybe the guidelines for, for, for a CPA firm would be, we don't do these when there's an irrevocable trust. We don't do these when there's stock options. We don't do these when there's anything complicated. But all of those are things that you'll need to uh, give some thought to with respect to this. Now, you ask, which companies have to report? And I say, just about every company, every limited partnership, every limited liability company, and even some trusts where in order to exist, you have to file with the federal government, the state government, or in an, a tribal, Indian tribal jurisdiction. So every LLC, every limited partnership, every registered entity, what's not exempt? Irrevocable trusts, and irrevocable trusts will become more and more popular. We'll talk more about that later. Also, proprietorships. Marsha owns a raccoon farm, and that raccoon farm would not have to register unless it becomes an LLC. What else is not is exempt? A general partnership. Marsha and I own a raccoon farm as general partners. We don't file with the state. What if we file a fictitious name notice as a general partnership? Well, then we, I don't believe we have to register them. But we would be crazy to own a general partnership because I don't want to be responsible if she's in a car accident on corporate business and vice versa. So what are the exemptions? What are these 23 categories that are exempt from registering under the uh, CTA? Well, if you're registered with the SEC, you're okay. If you're a governmental authority, you're okay. If you're a bank, you're okay. Credit union, okay. Depository institution holding company, okay. Money transmitting business, what the heck is that? You're okay. Brokerage or dealer in securities. Now, I think that means you have to register, not you, uh, not informally. This would be a formal registered brokerage firm, an SEC clearinghouse, a investment uh, advisory company, a venture capital fund registered with the SEC, a registered insurance company, a state licensed insurance producer, a commodity exchange entity, a public accounting firm registered with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So that's not most of you on this webinar. A normal CPA firm is gonna have to register unless you're a big employer, which we'll talk about. Public utilities have to register. Financial market utilities have to register. I mean, don't have to register. Public utilities do not have to register, sorry. Tax exempt entities. So your charities, your 501c4s, your uh, social clubs. One thing that's not clear to me is if you've not received your IRS status, you filed your 1023 or your 1024, but you didn't get an answer yet from the IRS, I'm gonna file those because I'm not sure. On the other hand though, uh, if you filed a 501c3 trust, then you would not have to register it. Uh, so those tax exempt organizations, now here's, here's one that you'll have a little bit of uh, play with, and that is what they call the large uh, operating company. So basically, I've got everything you need to know here on slide 52, and your client needs to have $5 million 
of volume and 20 or more US-based full-time employees. And a full-time employee is somebody working at least 30 hours a week. Please don't tell anyone who works for me that a full-time employee is working 20 hours a week. We, we at our firm, work 40 hours a week, I think, or at least I know I work 40 hours a week, two weeks every day. Okay, page 53, the subsidiary of an exempt entity. Most, ex most subsidiaries of exempt entities will be exempt. And finally, an inactive entity. You know what, if your client has an inactive entity, just close it down before the filing deadline. This is a time to go ahead and clean things up, get companies uh, merged together so there's few of them. But what is an inactive entity? An inactive entity has to have existed before January 1st, 2020, is not engaged in any active business, no change of ownership in the last 12 months, no assets more than a thousand dollars you know too many of just file it or terminate it that's the inactive entity exception so now we're going to go to polling question number two wesley great job on the polling question placement here we're right exactly on time do you predict that a the cta will be required in 2024 that it's actually going to happen your dream or nightmare will come true, or B, the CTA implementation will be delayed beyond 2022, C, that pigs have wings, or D, none of the above. You guys think that's funny, huh? Ugh, the last joke really bombed. All right, what percentage do we have there? 88, okay, good enough. All right, what has to be included in the corporate filings? And here's, here's the disappointment, and maybe they'll come down off of this. Some easy things. The legal name and any trade names or DBAs of the business, the street address of the business's principal place of business. Now, I don't know about you, there are some clients that are using my office address because they don't really have a, a place of business. Everything's on the internet. And when I set up these companies, we always use our address as the place of business for the first few weeks until we get all the junk mail and we get the IRS mail. And then we send that to the CPA and the client, and then we move that to the client's address. Well, we've got to be more careful about that now because we may be committing uh, a, an offense if we do that. So that's going to be, Wesley, make sure we do a slide on that. That's going to be a mess. Okay. Secondly, the state of formation. That's fine. Then the tax ID number. Well, this is interesting. They want you to, for a new company formed January 1, 2024 or after, you'll have 30 days, or they're saying it may be 90 days, to report, and you have to report your tax ID number. Good luck getting a tax ID number within those 90 days. So here's a trick of the trade. When we file a new company now, we go to the IRS website, and before we create the company, we make sure that the IRS website will give us a tax ID number. You know, if the client wants to call the company Raccoon Tails Inc., and there's a Raccoon Tails Inc. in Hawaii, then they won't give us a tax ID number for, cat, for, for Raccoon's Tail Inc. in Florida. But then if we call it Ratu, Raccoon's Tail Enterprises Inc., and there's no Raccoon Tail Enterprises Inc. anywhere in the United States, then we can get an instant tax ID number. So 
That's what you want to start telling your clients. They want an instant number and not wait a long time. Now, what about the fact that you don't need a tax ID number for an LLC that is owned by a single individual? No tax ID number is needed. Well, you're going to have to get a tax ID number now unless the regulations do something about that. So good luck getting a bunch of tax ID numbers next year. Every, the, there's, I think they said there's going to be 37 million entities registering. I hope that website works very well and that we're going to be able to get all of these things. Okay. The FinCEN identifier number. So here is a little bit of background and why you'll probably want to get a FinCEN identifier number. When I file my company with FinCEN, they want to know the name, the, uh, the personal address, and the driver's license pass or passport number of every person owning more than 25% and in control of the entity. That's a lot of information, but here's what's worse. If, let's say that you have a client that's involved in 10 companies, the rule also says that if any of those people change their address or get a replacement driver's license or passport, then every entity has to update their records. And if you don't, you have up to $500 a day fine. Plus now I'm on 10 entities. In fact, I personally will be probably on a hundred entities because of, I'm the trustee of a number of trusts. So, you know, what happens when I get a new driver's license? I have to update a hundred entities. Plus, a lot of our clients really are afraid that there will be some inappropriate disclosure where somebody who works for the government will inappropriately disclose this information to somebody else. So, the opportunity here is that I can apply for my own FinCEN number. I'll go to their website, because this is all going to be electronic, and I will file my, here's my driver's license, here's my personal address, here's my other information. And then when I go to register all the companies, instead of saying, in charge of this company is Alan Gassman, and all that data, I'll only have to say, in charge of this company is 349662, my number won't have to tell it my name or all my other information. And then when I get my new driver's license or Marsha throws me out and I have to get my own address, I'll only have to update my page and not all the pages. And I won't have to tell everyone involved and all the companies I'm involved with when I have that situation. So you will want to get your FinCEN number. Now, Please keep in mind that everything I'm telling you is subject to change, but when the next regulations and announcements and pronouncements come out, but this is what this is the best available information as of now. So here is the next polling question. This polling question is named after my favorite real estate lawyer, Matt Poling, who is in Tampa. All right. Do you view the Transparency Act as A, a tremendous pain and expense, B, an income making opportunity, which by the way, may help us get our clients more organized. C, a personal growth opportunity, or D, worse than a chain letter. And if you don't know what a chain letter is, let me know and I have a friend that I can introduce you to. 
Okay, are we at 83%? 85, all right. That's the temperature in the winter here in Florida sometimes. All right, we're gonna go now to the next question, and that is, what is a substantial control person? It's somebody who just wants to be in charge of everything, right? No, a substantial control person is a person who has, believe it or not, substantial control over an entity. It could be a manager, it can be an officer, it can be a director. So what if I'm only the assistant chair, uh, secretary of a company? I'm not entitled under the state law to actually do anything with respect to the company other than to take minutes of meetings. Well, I'm still an officer, so I still need to be disclosed. So one of the things that you're gonna to wanna to put on your checklist to talk to your clients is, do you still wanna be an officer? Do you still wanna be in control? Do you wanna be an owner? Do you wanna give all this to your daughter-in-law and get yourself off of it? the same way as your jet ski and anything that would cause liability. These are all good questions to ask your clients to get them thinking about what the possible impact of this act is. And by the way, what is their personal liability? Do you really wanna be a manager of a company that is uh, doing something that you could be sued for if you're found to be negligent? So opportunity to update client planning. Now, for many of our clients, we have management companies to maintain confidentiality. So we'll have a client that owns five apartment houses, a couple of duplexes. We'll put them in five different LLCs, make the managers of those LLCs a Wyoming company called Wyoming Management LLC. So when people go to the Florida Secretary of State, they can't figure out who owns it, who's in control of it. But the manager of that Wyoming company is the person who needs to register. And it has to be the ultimate person. So a lot of you have clients that are trustees of trusts. And these are maybe crummy withdrawal trusts, and they maybe own 1% or 2% of an entity. And maybe they own half percent voting. Well, I've got to send them an email, maybe pretty soon, saying, Dear Janet, you may recall that you signed an irrevocable trust in 1986 and that you are holding half percent of the voting stock of ABC LLC. Please send me a copy of your driver's license, confirm your personal address so that I can register this with the federal authorities. By the way, I hope you had a great 90th birthday. I mean, what kind of response do you think we're gonna get to these things? Most clients are gonna go, oh yeah, ho-hum, another thing, here's my driver's license. I was thinking I'm gonna start charging clients maybe $75 for everything I ask for a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh time so that I can retire early. Because getting this information from the clients and figuring out who has substantial control? So if you're a CPA, are you now gonna write a letter to every single lawyer who drafted every single trust, every single LLC? Please confirm who has substantial control of this entity. Let's say I'm the trustee of a trust. I have substantial control, but the grantor of the trust can replace me. She has substantial control, and the mother-in-law has a power to appoint trust assets to creditors of her estate. Does she have substantial control? I don't know. So if you believe in aliens from outer space, they may have substantial control. And then you have the question of 
who is the beneficial owner? And that's where you'll go and look not only at who the owner is, but who the owner of the owner is, and who the owner of the owner is, and who the owner of the owner is. Those of you who are lawyers remember now, and there's language later, but I may not get to it, that you're going to want to update your operating agreements to say that all members will be required to make all disclosures requested to comply with the Corporate Transparency Act. And you may as well put the members' re uh, personal residences and, a, and attach a copy of their driver's license to the darn agreement if that doesn't offend them and say their driver's license is either attached as Exhibit A or will be given confidentially to the law firm of ABC or the person will register with SINFIN. Now, here's a good question. The person says, oh, I registered with SINFIN. Here's my SINFIN number. Well, how do I know if that's really their SINFIN number? It could be somebody else's SINFIN number. There's nothing in the law that tells us how the identity or uh, veracity, which is a legal word for honesty, of the SINFIN uh, number was, was provided. So my grammar's really off today. I'm sorry about that. All right, polling question number four, which means that those of you who only need to be 50 minutes under your state law only have 14 more suffering minutes to survive this. Here is polling question number four. Would you like to beta test our estate view software? Answer number one, I already do, shut up about it. Or answer number two, heck no, shut up your face. Answer number three, yes, yes, please. I really, really want to beta test a state view software, which is free until December 31st, 2023. It's a good thing Alan hardly ever promotes it or D, the number you have dialed has been disconnected. Please don't try again. Okay, Wesley, I know we're gonna get so many A's. Where are we at? 90, what is that? 85, very good. Wesley, by the way, do you know, uh, can you tell us that first question I think was, how, what percentage of CPAs and lawyers say that they're going to be doing the FinCEN work versus what say they won't? Do you have that number there, or can you look? What's that? On what? Whose screen? It's 31% say they will. 25% say they will not. Okay, so 31% of you said that you will be doing the the registrations for this and 25% said you won't, and the rest of you were clearly asleep. Okay, or you haven't decided, which is fine. Okay, now there are exceptions, as, as one of my friends says, there's the rule, and then there's always the exception to the rule, and then there's always the exceptions to the exceptions. So here's some of the exceptions. The first exception is the minor child. The minor child doesn't have to register, but one of the parents has to register. So when you get a divorce now, you're gonna to have to decide which parent is gonna be in charge of registering for the minor child. And when the minor child becomes a, a adult, which is age 18 in most states. I'm not sure what the regulations are gonna say as far as those states where it's still 21, I think there's one or two of them, then they have to register themselves. I think they have 30 days, I'm not sure of that. Secondly, if you are a nominee, it's not really your asset, you're serving 
for somebody else, or you're an intermediary, or you are a custodian under the Gift to Minors Act, then the regulations which will come out will relieve you from registering, but guess what? I'm gonna register anyway, because there's always a chance that somebody's gonna look at it and go, aha, your name's here, but you didn't register. Well, I registered just to make sure that there was no mistake, that I wasn't trying to hide anything. Okay, third, the employee of a reporting company acting solely as an employee, an employee who has no control. That's where the question is, does the person have control or not? That's where if you're a CPA firm, it's good to have a lawyer write a letter saying it does not appear that Polly has control. When she's in trouble, underdog comes and saves the day, underdog has control. Okay, creditors are not required to report. And I'm sure that the banking system was pleased about that. The question though is, if I loan money to someone and I have an option to convert that, or I have a warrant, or my the debt that I have becomes an ownership interest, then am I really an owner? You know, there is something called the equity kicker, which is you loan money to somebody, and you if things go well, you get not only your money and interest, but you get a little bit more. Uh, those types of things, when you have options, warrants, you have to be careful. When in doubt, register. And then finally, an individual whose only interest is a future interest through a right of inheritance. So there's confusion there too. In fact, I think Weinberg has a full 90 minute talk on how trustees can determine whether what they're holding is a future inheritance or a right of inheritance versus a reportable ownership. These rules are also not so solid yet, but what it appears to say, which is really, this is a really nice one, is that if somebody dies, well, that's not nice. When you die, is not nice, but when you inherit, it's nice. But when someone dies and there's a probate going on or a trust administration, the next beneficiaries don't have to, the ultimate beneficiaries don't have to register until they receive it. Well, that could go, I think Jimi Hendrix's estate is still open. Elvis Presley's estate is still open. They do that to hold the uh, intellectual property rights. So uh, that's gonna be one way that people will delay uh, reporting, but it's probably not worth having your relative die so that you can delay reporting. So more information here on uh, minors, and of course that's children, not people who actually are coal miners or other kinds of minors, although I'm sure there will be confusion over that uh, somewhere. Okay, so we talked about creditors. Okay, when do these reports need to be filed? Well, CPAs will be glad to hear. It won't be April 15th. It won't be September 15th. It won't be October 15th. It will be 30 or 90 days after the formation of an entity. It's 30 days under the statute, but the Treasury Department has announced that they want it to be 90 days. But for existing entities, only 37 million of them by estimate. It will be December 31st, 2024. So good luck doing that and your year end 2024 planning. It is going to be PPP all over again, except you're not gonna get paid by PPP. You're not gonna get nice money from the government. You're just gonna have an expense. And what does the government say that this should cost? Well, they say the easy ones should cost $85. I, I can't even accept a phone call and take notes on the call and do a memo to file for $85. So 
it's going to be a real challenge even to even to verify with your client did you file it or am I, you want me to file it are you going to file it so if you don't have salesforce right now or 65 employees in the philippines it is time to get these systems in order if you're working with excel and managing your practice with excel guess what it's time to go to google sheets or something better it's time to to get ready to inform everyone that you're not going to help or decide who you're going to help if you have 400 clients with a cpa firm or a law firm you're the cpa they're the lawyer it's time to decide who's going to help all these clients i don't think that they're going to want to hear that no one wants to help them so it is uh going to be an interesting year okay lots of questions here lots of of other information uh page 96 does again tell you what i said now uh who who has to report on formation it's still the owner it's still the company it's still the people in control but it's also the former not the latter the person who forms it and it's not just abc law firm formed this llc it is julie who is alan gasman's secretary filed the articles of organization with the secretary of state here's her home address and her driver's license and she was supervised by alan here is his sinfin number oh but brandon helped too here's his sinfin number they want to know everyone involved now why do they want all this information remember why al capone went to jail everyone knows who al capone was right he was a famous gangster he had people people killed he had illegal gambling he had prohibition broken he had prostitution going the only thing they could convict him on was tax evasion they couldn't convict him on anything else so you're going to see some bad players go to jail because they didn't register under this rule a two-year jail sentence and who's going to go to jail with them that lawyer who helped them form the entity and put someone else's name in as the owner and his secretary so it's going to be a lot of fun for somebody for defense lawyers all right more information on trusts there is again the need to let your clients who are trustees especially elderly clients know that this is coming up so they don't take it as a, a surprise so again the updates are going to be um, significant the penalties are going to be significant i've been able to really cover this um, pretty well so now we'll talk about the confidentiality well first let me see if there's any questions okay the first question is when will this ever be over okay the second question is what happened to the humor this time you haven't said anything funny yet okay does an llc owned by a single operating company need to report yeah I, well i would think yes why are s corporations required to report since they already report into the ownership that's a great point christine they don't report who's in charge of them and sometimes an s corporation will report ownership by a trustee if it's an esbit but then an, an electing small business trust but it doesn't report 
who the beneficiaries of the trust are. So you may have a complex trust that reports, but you the, the Treasury Department wants this information. Okay, the Dorita thinks that the penalty will be delayed. I hope that's correct. John says, how are multi-tiered entities handled? Well, the, you'll have to report the entity and the ultimate owner of the entity. So every entity is gonna report not only itself, but the entity that owns it will have to be looked at to decide who owns that entity. And you may not be able to find out. I certainly have clients that own an LLC that has somebody from Canada who invested through a Canadian company. And we're gonna say, hey, tell us who the owner of this Canadian company is. And the person's gonna go, hey, remember we had that fight because you didn't invite me to Thanksgiving dinner last year? Forget it, I'm not having to tell you this. I'm in Canada. I don't have to reply to follow US law. Here's another question. Does an offshore entity have to report? Yes, if there's a US owner or a US uh, person in charge, there will have to be reporting. How about an offshore trust? Probably not, unless the existence of the trust is dependent upon registration. How about an Alaska Asset Protection Trust where you have to register the entity? With, I'm sorry, how about a Nevis Irrevocable Trust where you have to register the entity in Nevis? Probably not because it exists before you register it in Nevis. You just have to register it in Nevis to avoid um, penalties. So let me see. There are individuals who do not have a driver's license or passport. For example, my grandmother. What do you do? Well, you get a governmental ID. And Wesley, I don't know what that really means. Let's write a little memo on how you would get a governmental ID if you don't have a driver's license or a passport. But maybe grandma would like to go ahead and transfer those assets to someone else. Okay, and I'm a CPA in the business as a sales use tax auditor for a government. We rarely rely on Secretary of State records. Um, let me see, appreciate this information because they have extensive contact. Well, that's interesting. So one question is who's gonna see all this information that I'm filing? I mean, I have clients who lost significant wealth in Germany from the Holocaust and still are very fearful of why anyone would need to know their personal information. Well, this is going into a government database and any person who leaks this information will be subject to five years in prison and a $150,000 fine. Nevertheless, this base has been the subject of invasion publicly. There are crazy people who work for the government. There's crazy people everywhere. So it is possible that this information will be uh, shared. So that's just a fact of life. The good news is the IRS does not have access to this. Even the FBI will not have access to this unless they have special reason to do so, similar to the process of getting a warrant. So it should be fair. I, I personally am not concerned about it. It's already in my tax returns. Everyone who works for my CPA already knows all about our information. So, uh, but for some people it will be of concern. And for some people, they'll they'll give up their US citizenship and leave because this will be the last straw and they don't like what's going on in the elections. You know, these things will happen. Okay, is the ownership rule 20% or more or less than 25%? It's 20% or more. So if it's 24.9999999999%, you're okay, but 25% you have to register. Uh, is there Attribution rules between a married couple or related people? Thank heaven, not yet. They didn't put in section 267. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad of that. Um, 
Will you be doing a webinar just on which trusts are required to report if an entity is administratively dissolved? Yeah, Wesley, let's schedule a report. I mean, let's schedule a webinar on trust planning for confidentiality and under this act. Linda, thank you very much for that suggestion. Okay, that's a lot of the questions. In five minutes, which for many of you is two tenths of a billable hour, I want to show you a final slide. And this is the conversation that I will have with many clients when they say, well, what is confidential and what can I do that's confidential? And I'll see what I can cover in five minutes and then I may go a little bit over for the three of you that would stay. So on the far right, I have an irrevocable trust. The Uniform Trust Code is the law that was created by some law professors and then adapt, adopted or adapted by many, many, most states. The Uniform Trust Code and Florida statutes say that if I set up an irrevocable trust and that irrevocable trust has an activity or a property and gets sued as the owner of that activity or that property, that the beneficiaries of that trust are not liable. They are not responsible. The trustee of the trust is not responsible unless the trustee was negligent or otherwise broke a law or possibly in some environmental situations. So doesn't this give me the same limited liability as a company, but without the need to register with the state? So I have had clients who live in California form trusts like this to own real estate to limit liability to avoid that California $800 a year filing fee. We've had clients do this in Florida, and if the trust is properly drafted, it may the transfer may not only get you limited liability, but avoid reassessment under the Florida law that says that if you change beneficial owners of a non-homestead property, the property may be reassessed above and beyond what we have now, which is a 10% cap on annual appreciation. So I own a house in Florida that's being taxed at a 500,000 value. It doubled in value over the last two years. For the most part, it can only be taxed at 110% of 500,000 in the first year of appreciation, then 110% of 550,000 in the second year. But if I transfer it to an LLC, it goes up to the, to the million. But if I transfer it to an irrevocable trust, where my friend's the trustee, but I'm the sole lifetime beneficiary, I may be able to get that limited liability and avoid the 10% Clients also want to know, how can I keep my companies and my businesses and my homestead confidential? Because I don't want an angry client or some waitress who I didn't tip enough and knows my name to go to the property appraiser website and in three minutes know my address and show up there. So, you know, we're living, living in a crazier and crazier country. So in most states, certainly including Florida, I can set up a land trust. It's considered as owned by Marsha and I, and the trustee of the land trust is the ABC123 company in Wyoming. So now the property appraiser website shows the owner of our homestead is ABC123 
LLC. The property appraiser in almost every county in Florida, all the ones we've dealt with, is glad to continue the homestead exemption without disclosing the owner. So now they search my name, they're not gonna find it. Or they wanna know if I own the house I live in, they're not gonna figure that one out either. They're just gonna see that it's owned by this trust by ABC123, a Wyoming LLC, and Wyoming doesn't disclose owners or managers. So that may be one planning thing that comes to mind for these clients. Then you have a client with multiple entities and maybe they own multiple companies, multiple LLCs. Maybe you put those multiple LLCs all in Wyoming. Maybe you have to put them in your state, but you have them owned by a holding company. You see a Delaware holding company there. And then you have them managed by a management company. So what happens is when someone wants to know who owns this rental house LLC, they look in your state website and it says the owner is a Delaware LLC, the manager is a Colorado LLC. And they go to those websites and Delaware, Colorado, Wyoming, and certain other states don't disclose managers, don't disclose owners. So now you have secrecy. Now, why do I have a holding company there? I can have the four Wyoming LLCs owe money under a legitimate promissory note and even a mortgage or a right to give a mortgage to the Delaware holding company. And now if somebody sues Wyoming LLC one and gets a judgment, we sell the assets in Wyoming LLC one, the first money goes to the holding company, which has the mortgage. So a plaintiff lawyer is going to be much more likely to settle when you have this kind of debt. Now do not make the Delaware parent company the manager of the subsidiaries or it could be sued when the subsidiaries get sued for being a negligent manager. I prefer Wyoming to Delaware. Here are some reasons. Number one, Wyoming is less expensive in filing fees and less expensive for termination. Number two, Wyoming is faster to respond to questions, or at least that has been our experience. Let me tell you something interesting about Delaware, and that is if you don't file your annual report and you don't pay them hundreds of dollars to terminate your Delaware LLC, they report you to a credit agency who comes after the officers of the company and duns their credit. So do you want that? I don't. But certainly for larger situations, Delaware law in the corporate area is deemed to be superior by uh, most people. So now the Delaware Holding Company is owned by a Florida Irrevocable Trust for Children or Grandchildren and the client. So now if somebody sues the client, they can only get a charging order against the Delaware Holding Company, not possession or control of the Delaware Holding Company, or better yet, my client may put ownership of the holding company under an asset protection trust where it would be difficult or maybe even a pot impossible for a judgment creditor to reach the asset protection trust. Law is not clear, but it's extra work for a plaintiff lawyer and the alternate trustee of the Asset Protection Trust may be an offshore trustee. So good luck if the Nevada trustee resigns and this thing goes offshore, the assets are sold and an offshore trustee is holding the assets. Good luck to a creditor who appears on the scene after all of this has been established. Now, what do you do for an S corporation? 
Well, that needs to be owned by trusts that qualify as S corporation trusts. I mean, as as Q, Q subs disregarded or ESBITs, electing small business trusts, not by an offshore trust. And if you have an S corporation with appreciated assets and activities, go ahead and divide it up using a new parent F reorganization. So when clients ask you about confidentiality, as long as you're bringing up the subject, you can bring this up as well. Okay, let me just see if there's any other uh, questions. Um, Jason, does a regular does a registered agent have to be included in the reporting? No. Thank you for asking. The registered agent does not have to be reported. Um, how will this affect gun trusts in Florida, Christine? That is a heck of a good question. I don't think it will affect gun trusts because I don't you can form a gun trust without registration with the federal government. You just have to register it after you form it. So Wesley, we need to make sure that we determine that and we need to update our gun trust book for that question. I, I know I've heard that, but we'll go ahead and verify it. Mark, does the due date for the address change number of days to file? I think we answered that. Um, let me see, anything else? When will this webinar finally be over? That is the final question. It's over now. Thank you so much for joining us. We welcome questions, comments, and suggestions to A. Gassman at gassmanpa.com. Any suggestions you may have on uh, future presentations, also appreciated. In 24 minutes, we're doing the webinar, uh, 90 minutes, on how to use the Estate View software. Uh, if you're interested in that, just send us an email. We'll answer it and have a great, 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 wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you again. Bye.